let's get going and then I'll, 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 let's talk about that. Good. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. I'm incredibly excited today to have five of eight managing directors of Tweedy Brown here to discuss value investing, the past, the future, uh, how it evolves. We'll be talking to them right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, gents. How are you? Terrific. Good. How are you? Nice. Great. So I... Uh, I've never had a podcast with five uh, folks on it before, so we'll just have to uh, grope our way forward here. But uh, surely everybody who listens to this podcast knows who Tweety Brown is, but I just thought I'd give a little, uh, a brief potted history. Tweety Brown famously uh, was Graham's broker and uh, has been managing money for outside investors since 1968, 1969. Uh, continuously since then, uh, and that's a that's a that's an important date because uh, you also helped Warren Buffett get control of Berkshire Hathaway. So absolutely storied name in the value community. So I guess the first question is, um, how have you maintained the culture of the firm, and how have you kept that continuity of that very disciplined value approach? How have you sustained that over such a long period of time? Maybe I'll maybe I'll start. Uh, my name's Bob Wyckoff. I've I've been here at at Tweedy since uh, 1991, uh, so I've been here 28 years, and my my associates here have been here for also very very long periods of time. So, I guess Tobias, the first thing I would say is value investing is in the blood here at at Tweedy. Um, we started in 1920. Uh, as a firm, Tweedy and Company, uh, we're about to celebrate this year. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary Amazing. as an investment organization. And in the first half of that period, we were a broker. And uh, we started in 1920. It was founded by a fellow named uh, Forrest Tweedy. And he was looking for a niche in the securities business. And he fell upon the idea of making markets in inactively traded, closely held public companies. And these were companies that often were owned or controlled by families on occasion. There was very little uh, public ownership, but there was some uh, public ownership. The stocks traded by appointment. You couldn't go down to your local broker and buy the shares. Um, And Tweedy sort of developed a business around that market segment. And he would go to the annual meetings of companies every year and he would copy down the shareholder list and he'd go back to his office and he would crank out postcards, sending them out to all the shareholders in the company, offering to make a market in the shares should they desire some liquidity. And by almost any definition of value, when those shares did trade because they were liquid, they often traded at substantial discounts from just about any measure of value you could come up with. And that attracted the attention of Ben Graham, who you know whose big idea, big thesis is that there are in essence two prices for every share of stock, the price you see on the exchange at any given moment, and the other price, the price that would accrue to the investor in the event the entire company Uh, were sold in an arm's length negotiated transaction. And Graham referred to that price as intrinsic value. And to Graham, the essence of investing was exploiting big discrepancies between those uh, two prices. So these inactive securities were interesting uh, to Graham. And a brokerage relationship developed uh, so much so that we moved our offices uh, down the hall from his at 52 Wall Street in the 1940s. He retired, uh, as you may know, in the mid-1950s. And um, when he retired, his star analyst, Warren Buffett, 
He offered the business to Warren. Warren declined. Warren went back to Omaha, Nebraska, started the Buffett Partnership. We all know Warren's history. But there was another uh, young analyst at Graham Newman named Tom Knapp. And Tom uh, left Ben Graham's firm when he retired and walked down the hall and joined Tweedy Brown. And Tom is the person who really helped transition the firm from a broker in these uh, inactive securities uh, to now being an investor. And initially in the late 1950s, it was the partner's capital. And then you were, you were correct, in the late 1960s, we got our first outside client when a fellow named Ed Anderson joined Tweedy. And Ed came to Tweedy from Wheeler Munger which was Charlie Munger's firm out in uh, Los Angeles. So um, there's a lot of rich history here. You ask, how do we maintain the culture? Um, uh, people have long tenures here. It's kind of in the blood. We all know the stories, even people who came later. Uh, so the culture, the value culture at Tweedy is extraordinarily strong. One of the things that I have observed over particularly over the last five years, and it feels funny to talk about a five-year period when I'm speaking to you gentlemen who are celebrating 100 years, but uh, there seems to have been, there's been a, a gradual shift from, when Graham started out, it was net current asset value, and then that has been, he as he evolved too, he, he defined it differently. And Buffett clearly has a di different definition too, which is that compound style franchise looking for future growth and valuing that appropriately. I think that we've now reached a, a point where it's almost, it's almost all growth value and there are very few folks who are even looking at the balance sheet at all, which is funny because that's one of the complaints that Graham had uh, when, he wrote, uh, when he wrote security analysis. So how, how, did, how, how does Tweedy Brown uh, handle that? How do you deal with that, that evolution and where, where do you put yourselves along that continuum from the very deep value to the franchise value? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that, that uh, this is Jay Hill speaking. I, I, I would say that we're one of the few firms that actually does both. Um, so we, we're, we actually invest in better businesses that we think that, that can compound over time if we can buy them at two thirds of uh, what we estimate the private market value of that business is. Um, but we also are willing to buy very statistically cheap uh, securities that we refer to as bobbers where the valuation um, methodology is generally balance sheet derived. So this would be um, either classic uh, Ben Graham, where you're trying to buy companies at two thirds or of net current asset value. That's less prevalent today. Um, but it would also include trying to buy, you know, highly cyclical securities um, at a big discount to, let's say, uh, tangible book value. Um, as long as the debt is low. That's right. As long as the debt is low, the balance sheet is strong, and it's a business that we think we have no concerns or serious concerns that the business won't get through the, the cycle. Because usually when you're buying them right at a big discount to tangible book, the near-term outlook is not pleasant. <laughs> right. So we insist on strong balance sheets in those situations. Um, but we're willing to do both. And I think that is something that differentiates Tweedy Brown from other investors. And I would agree with you. When I read value investor insight and sort of other uh, uh, publications that talk about value investing, it's clear that the, the vast majority of value investors have moved towards the Buffett style uh, definition of value and, and moved away from sort of classic Graham cigar butts. But I would add to what Jay has said, uh, during our process of analyzing a company, we spend a, a, an enormous amount of time studying the documents, studying the annual report. When I look at the company, I start by looking at the notes first. <laughs> then I go to the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement and see how they tie together if the income is real. And the last thing I read is the chairman's propaganda. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but that's just part of the process, and we'll talk about that later. But a key characteristic, uh, Tobias, is price sensitivity. Uh, Tweedy is very price sensitive. As Jay said, willing to own a great business, an average business, a deeply cyclical business, but all at a price. Usually that price is somewhere around two-thirds of a conservative estimate of value, 
uh, or less. And um, um, as you know, private market values today have gone up and up as debt has become so cheap. So um, we have limits, right? We will step away from observed comparables in the market, what companies are paying in terms of enterprise value to EBIT or whatever metric you might be using, we may step off those multiples a bit in valuing a business if we think those multiples aren't sustainable. But then we want the business at two thirds of that estimated value. And and I think that's the characteristic that, that differentiates Tweedy me- from the better business value people. Let me give you a little bit of background over the last 40 years. Uh, When I joined in 1989, we were valuing businesses, if it was an earnings-based valuation, we were valuing businesses at eight times and buying them at uh, five times EBIT. Right. During during the 90s and early 2000s, we moved to a valuation of 10, maybe 11 times and buying them at seven. Now we are in a range where we're comfortable valuing businesses at 10 to maybe 13 times for an exceptional business and then buying them at a 33% discount. So that's how we evolve. There are not enough current assets to fill a portfolio now. There are not enough stocks that trade at a significant discount to net current assets. To fill They've been arbitraged out. There are not enough book value stocks. But when we find them, as Jay has said, if they have very little debt, then we'll We'll go. And the evolution of those multiples relates directly to the decline in interest right. rates that we've seen over time. When I when I first came to New York, it was 1980, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't at Tweedy at that point, but I showed up in New York to start my career in the investment business. And Paul Volcker, the year before, had been named head of the Federal Reserve, really tightened uh, money to try to bring inflation under control and uh, interest rates were at sky high levels. And, and just look at what's happened since 1980, 40 years of a decline from those multiples now down to the zero to negative rates we have today. You anticipated my next question, which was what, what, what's, what causes the increase in the multiples? Uh, Bob, you, I know that you're a JD. So what, how, how did you transition from JD to the investment world? Well, it was interesting. When I was in um, an undergraduate in college, I took an investment course uh, my senior year, and I really enjoyed it. And my dad was an investor. And when I was a kid, in my early teens, he bought me some stocks. And uh, back in the uh, late 1960s, 19, really late 1960s, mid 1960s, you'd open up the newspaper to look for your uh, the price of your stock, right? And I used to do that all the time at home. So I was I was deeply interested in the stock market, uh, but I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go down a legal path or a business path. I knew if I went down the legal path, I could do either. So I went down the legal path. I practiced law for a couple of years, but I had interviewed at an investment firm and I got a call from that firm two years into my legal practice and uh, decided to take that job. And that brought me to New York uh, and I've been in the business uh, ever since. Uh, When Tweety Brown uh, implements this philosophy, and I think that you, you you're probably the purest expression of Graham, although I acknowledge that you've, you've evolved as you've gone along. How, how does that manifest? I know that you run some funds, and Bob, you might want to read your uh, disclaimer before you answer that. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I will, I will. If we talk about our funds, they, uh, there's a little disclaimer. Investors, anyone watching the podcast should consider the funds that we may mention their investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Uh, Prospectus uh, containing this and other information about the funds is available on our website at www.tweety.com. Investors should read that prospectus carefully before investing. And of course, past performance uh, does not guarantee uh, future results. Uh, With that in mind, Uh, We do one thing here, and it's only value investing, and we do it only in equities, uh, and we do it in global, uh, international, 
and we have some what we call global high dividend portfolios, which is really undervalued securities with an above average uh, dividend yield. Uh, and those are the three things we do. And we have uh, different vehicles in each one of those categories, uh, commingled vehicles together with a separate account capability and even an offshore capability for non-US investors. So the business is pretty simple. In essence, we're running three portfolios for the most part here at the firm, but we have lots of different ways you can participate in those portfolios. When you're thinking about portfolio composition for those portfolios, do you, do you, do you, how, how do you think about diversification? How do you think about concentration? Do you like to hold more and better ideas equal weight? How, what's the process for that? Uh, I think <clears throat> one of the most important uh, things that, uh, that I've learned in my over 30 years at Tweedy is uh, how much of a humbling business this is. You think you know, you look at the company, it looks great, you, you get excited, and then, then it doesn't work out. So uh, over the years, we have been highly diversified. I would, the analogy I would bring to you is if you only underwrite suburbans as a car insurance company, and uh, the kids are under 16, uh, and uh, the father has a stable job, all that kind of stuff. You underwrite the portfolio of securities like this, you're probably going to make money if you price it right. Uh, it's uh, the, the diversification gives you downside protection. Uh, I recognize the fact that if you all own if you own five stocks and those five stocks go to the roof, your performance is going to be uh, extremely good. But you have to be right. And um, Bob has spoken in the past about the period of the nifty 50s and uh, how that turned out with, when people were investing in one decision stocks. You know, that's all you had to do. And uh, then the commute pants that came in uh, uh, 1973. I, I would but, just add to what Tom said. So <clears throat> our portfolios, Ben Graham believed in great diversification, what he called the law of, of large numbers. And as Tom said, he almost brought an insurance underwriting uh, uh, idea to the process of investing. And so our portfolios are diversified by issue, by industry, by country, and by market capitalization. So we're willing to own market caps all the way down to a couple of hundred million and all the way up to several hundred billion, et cetera. Um, and we really live with only three constraints. We limit our exposure. We try to limit our exposure to a particular industry group of somewhere not more than about 15 to 20 percent in a particular industry, no more than three to four percent at cost uh, when we're buying an initial uh, security, and typically no more than 20 to 25 percent will invest in a single country. Um, and those are our constraints. Uh, setting those aside, the portfolios break down wherever we're finding. Uh, undervalued securities, and they don't look anything like indexes. So um, your viewers shouldn't confuse diversification with a portfolio that looks like a market portfolio, because it it tends to look very different. Our country weights, our industry weights, are often radically different uh, from what you uh, what you see in an index. How, how do you allocate responsibility for do you, are there industry specialists? Is everybody a generalist? Does somebody take on a company and follow that company individually? How, 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 do, you, how do you deal with those issues? Yeah, uh, the, uh, we all screen and we screen a lot. And then uh, what we aim for is that everybody is a generalist. The way human beings work is such that some, you know, some people are more attracted to certain businesses uh, than other people, but in principle, uh, we are all generalists. We have uh, some soft specializations. We have one analyst that tends to spend more time looking at the Far East, but there he will look at any type of company, of course, right? So 
um, that's that's the way we uh, we come at it. We I think it's best if you I, I used to always say that let's say you had a, a job working for a bilge bracket asset manager that runs 200 billion and you're the chemical analyst for Scandinavia and there are no cheap stocks. Right. This is not good for anything, not for your career. I mean, it's just this is a terrible situation to be in. So and then maybe the portfolio manager likes you a little bit. So he buys the cheapest of all the expensive stocks in chemicals in Scandinavia. Right. So we don't have that. Our aim is to all be generalists. Our aim is to all be, you know, sort of have a similar gene set. It takes you a while to get into that gene gene set. We are time moves a little bit differently because we're long term, slow investors. And so we're replaceable. There's no, there is, there are no stars. But we, we have different temperaments, different sort of. Uh, Tom likes pharma a lot, and he, he, he's, I call him a resident doctor. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so, but that's how it goes. So, he likes so, cement. Uh, I like cement. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that's more or less how the how the cookie crumbles. So you work on what comes out of your screens. You have that freedom, right? And you you check it with the other people. Are you are we not working on the same stock? But you know, sort of that's how we go about it. Could you take me through the way that an idea is generated through to it being added to a portfolio? Yeah. So um, and and by the way, Tobias, I read your book. Was a huge fan of your book. <laughs> And I think our philosophies are actually very similar. <laughs> I'm happy to hear um, that. Thank you so much. <laughs> but uh, look, what we're trying to do, as Bob mentioned earlier, we're trying to buy companies at two thirds or less of a conservative estimate of private market value. With private market value being defined as what would the business be worth if the CFO of the company that you're looking at picked up the phone and put the company up for auction tomorrow? Right. So it's a. Uh, uh, so we re really estimate value by studying M&A deals in different industries. Um, to use an analogy that I think everyone can understand, if you're looking to buy a home or if you're looking to sell a home, right, one of the most important things that you would want to know is what have similar homes sold for recently, right? Similar square footage on the same street, similar lot sizes. And are there opportunities to purchase a home, right, at a substantial discount to observed transactions? And that's really what we're trying to do. So um, one of the things that I think people find interesting about our process is that the analysts here probably spend anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of their time just tracking M&A deals in different industries and trying to build a frame of reference for what buyers in different industries, what types of multiples they're willing to pay. And I would say in general, multiples tend to be highly influenced by the organic growth prospects of the business, the returns on invested capital of the business, um, the stability of earnings, particularly through recessions. And if there's a fourth criteria, it would be synergy potential. There are certain industries where a buyer can pay a real, what looks like a really high multiple to the seller. Um, but in fact, it's a win-win for both the buyer and the seller because the cost synergies are so large that, that it can actually make sense for the buyer as well. Um, I, I can tell you that we apply this same theoretical private market value framework to both large cap companies like a Nestle, let's say, where the Prospects of a deal are highly unlikely just due to, the, due to the size of the company. We also apply this to small caps and mid caps where a deal is a very real possibility. Another thing that is probably important to understand is that we make sure that every new idea passes a two part test. So the first part is what I just mentioned. Is the stock trading at a substantial discount to a, our conservative estimate of intrinsic value based upon M&A deals, right? And the second criteria is is the stock just cheap on a standalone basis, uh, on a standalone absolute basis, uh, without looking at the M&A deals, right? And the reason that we have that second criteria is because we uh, realize that sometimes buyers overpay, and we don't want to extrapolate what we believe are unsustainable purchase price multiples on businesses that we're studying. Um, so that that that's really the the, the underlying criteria I can tell in terms of how do we identify new stocks. Can I just add sure. one thing? This is Frank sure. Harlock to what he said. It's sort of implied in what he said, but I'd like to state it explicitly, is, you know, the valuations have to have some sort of cash flow support. 
uh, because there are plenty of areas where you can find deals or values based on some metric that that isn't related to kind of earnings or operating income, some some other metric. Eyeballs so, that used so, to be very yeah. popular. Yeah, you, you've got yeah. it. So so <laughs> I just Flicks. wanted to, you know that this this idea of having cash flow support and not necessarily looking too far out in terms of making judgment, you know, how far out you go in assuming uh, the current earnings are going to continue. We try to think more here and now earnings, maybe look out a little bit, but not, not, not out years and years or decades. We do think a lot, especially about the better, bus better businesses, about the economics, the competitive environment, whether these returns are sustainable, but in terms of guessing future earnings and or ca discounting them back, we rely more on deal multiples instead of sort of some sort of discounted cash flow model. Go ahead. Yeah, and 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 I guess uh, the, sort of the next part of the process is how do we identify new ideas, right? And I would say probably eighty to ninety percent of the new ideas that that I've come up with over the years have come from quantitative screens. Um, there's no one quantitative Tweety screen that we use. Each analyst um, is uh, free to use their own methodologies. But in, in general, I would say that our, our screens tend to rhyme. Um, so we're, we're generally looking for companies with a market cap in excess of $200 million USD. So we'll go down into small cap uh, territory. Um, we're looking for companies that have an enterprise value to EBIT of less than 10 generally speaking. Um, we're also, there's a new metric that we're using um, that we refer to as owner earnings yield. And that probably deserves a little bit of an explanation. Um, tax rates have been coming down around the world, right? And, and it's our view that if you had two companies, each trading, let's say, at an enterprise value to EBIT of 10, but one company had a 40% tax rate and the other company had a 20% tax rate, we believe that the company with a lower tax rate is worth more. And so one of the metrics that we've come up to adjust for that and to adjust for the fact that tax rates have been coming down around the world is to look at what we call the owner earnings yield. And to define that explicitly, the owner earnings yield is the numerator is net operating profit after tax. Another way to say that would be EBIT times one minus the tax rate or Got after it. tax. That's the numerator. And then the denominator is enterprise value, the way you would traditionally calculate it. And generally speaking, for new ideas, we're looking for companies that have an owner earnings yield of 8% or higher. Um, and then we also have a metric, and I know you're a big fan of this as well. I read about it in your book that uh, <laughs> we're pretty risk averse when it comes to leverage. And so generally speaking, our screens have maximum net debt to EBITDA of two and a half times or less. That number's not set in stone. We realize some businesses have greater visibility than others. Um, and so there are instances where we'll buy a business that has higher leverage than that. Um, but, but lower but, is better. But lower is better, <laughs> absolutely. And, and then uh, I would say, look, we also look at uh, uh, competitors of businesses that we've studied. That's been a source of new ideas over time. We look at 52-week low lists. Um, insider buying, we're big believers and the efficacy of combining cheap quantitative criteria um, with insider buying. And so that's a, another, um, I guess, metric or tool that we use to uncover new ideas. Um, once we've identified a cheap stock, then really the real work begins. And that's when the analyst is going to go and, you know, read uh, the most recent 10K, 10Q, um, read relevant sell side research um, reports, um, read company presentations or analyst days, um, develop a financial model going back oftentimes 10 or 15 years uh, in time to study sort of the long-term underlying uh, trends in the business. Um, I think we spend a lot of time studying the margin history of a business over time and trying to understand um, why margins have either increased or decreased. Um, what we wanna really avoid, right, is valuing a company off of peak margins, that you're putting a multiple on, on a company that's earning sort of peak earnings and overvaluing the business, or the opposite, putting a multiple on trough earnings, right? So in, in, in many instances, we're, we're trying to estimate what's, what's normalized earnings over a cycle. We're also big believers in uh, free cash flow quality or, or free cash flow conversion. We define that as 
does the company do a good job of converting that that net income number on the income statement that has all types of accruals? Does the company actually convert that number at a high rate into free cash flow? Um, and so we'll look at, let's say, a five year period or a 10 year period. Free, free cash flow can be highly volatile, right? Even more volatile than earnings. But over a, an extended period of time, does the company convert its net income uh, into a high level of free cash flow? And if it does, that gives us uh, um, comfort that the earnings quality is high. Um, and then really the, the final job of the analyst is to obviously identify the, um, the attractive attributes or characteristics of a business, but also identify the risks. And I can tell you, Tobias, that any of the stocks that meet the quantitative criteria that excite us, right, that get us trembling with greed, have <laughs> uh, the, the, the near term news flow and the near term outlook is likely very bad. Right. And so the, the primary job of the analyst is to identify the risks, the most serious risks, and make judgments on whether or not we think those risks are cyclical, uh, meaning i.e. temporary, or are they more permanent in nature and structural. Um, if we ultimately can convince ourselves that the risks are more temporary, um, then the analyst will often uh, write up a full report, send it to the rest of the investment group, and then a discussion ensues on whether or not we should purchase the stock. And the discussion, if you were the proverbial fly on the wall at the Tweedy Brown meeting, 90% of the questions that are thrown at the analyst in a nice way uh, uh, deal with what's the downside. Because if you understand the downside, the stock is cheap, then the probabilities are in your favor. And this is a game of probabilities. How can you improve your odds of making a good decision? And, and Tobias, I would follow up with one final thought. Frank mentioned we don't like to predict earnings way out, and that's absolutely correct. But we are trying uh, to try to get a hold on what we think the earnings power of the business model is and the sustainability of that earnings power over time. And we're willing to be incredibly patient uh, as investors. We're not, we're not looking for catalysts for value recognition, which are, is kind of a thing some people do we these hope days. They will come. Uh, we, we would love to have catalysts, but usually if those are observable, it's in the price. So we're, uh, we're looking for those deep discounts and we're willing to be very, very patient and feel absolutely uh, strongly about the notion that we have less competition if we're looking at something and we're willing to think or uh, wait much further out for our returns. More often than not, that return comes in sooner than we would have anticipated, but we're willing to be patient. And in, in this day and age where information is a, is a commodity and it comes at you so quickly and investors have so much information, our edge, I, I think one of our biggest edges is, well, it's judgment and temperament, but it's also this longer term perspective because most people are telegraphed on the next six to 18 months. And if they're not gonna get value recognition during that period, they don't wanna own the stock we're willing to look much further out. Uh, this is the last question on the process, and then I'd like to ask you about what you're seeing in uh, today's markets. But uh, when I first started investing, I read Buffett's letters, then I read Security Analysis, and some of Graham and, Gra and uh, The Intelligent Investor. And then one of the very early documents that I read was uh, What Has Worked in Investing, the very famous Tweedy Brown uh -huh. document from, I'm not even sure the date, but it's, it's, it's an older, it's a, could be 20 years old at this stage. Maybe it's older than that. It's um, back about 91, 92. Is it as old as that? Yeah. Uh, the, that talks about quantitative factors that have done very well in the markets at, at that time. But uh, you make it explicit in many of your public statements that you do think very deeply about the qualitative factors as well. So can you, what, what, are, you, what are you thinking about in that pro process? What are you looking for? Uh, how does that manifest? I, if I may, I would say that you, especially if you're going to balance sheet type of valuations, there's a lot of traps out there. And if you play the game for a while, you learn about traps, individual companies being traps, you know, an, un, an unreliable majority shareholder who is trying to enrich himself or was only got the company quoted for reasons other than 
trying to sort of grow wealth over over long periods. So um, you can kind of, if you look at the long-term economic history of a business, that can help you a little bit because if, if there's no progress, that's not a good sign. So it then needs to be cheaper. The discount that you need to pay needs to be uh, needs to be bigger. So you ask yourself questions like, would I like to compete with this company? Would I like to try and push it out of business? And, and now you're going into the ter- terrain of what's what's the strength of their franchise and uh, some truly local and small companies you wouldn't want to compete with because they dominate let's say you know li- little rocks or or uh, uh, you know like a like a, a gravel pit or something it's a very difficult business to compete with very locally so, I mean, so it can be anything but you have to think about factors like that so you can't just say well, the numbers are low because before you know it, you own all the steel companies of the world, you know, at, at two times E. But this, this is not a good, but that, and that's a business that, you know, sort of is always thirsty for cash over long periods of time. So you have to watch out for these kinds of things. So you, you have to think it industrially, you have to think competitively. And those are the sort of the kind of qualitative things that are in our minds. Earnings based valuation or balance sheet type of valuation, we think about these things aggressively. You know, you can say, well, uh, the debt situation now, of airline XYZ is good, you know, if if things go sour, will they hit so their ratios really, really quickly? So you have to think about operational leverage in the business. If you have operational uh, leverage on top of financial leverage, you know, it becomes a little bit more tricky, right? So those are the kinds of the kinds of factors that are that are in our head. I, I, I want to make one point, you know, the qualitative is is critically important. In addition, Uh, to the quantitative. And we spend a lot of time and there's a lot of institutional memory here that goes way back. Uh, A good understanding of business models and the sustainability of business models, obviously in a world today that's being disrupted right and left all the time. I think back on something uh, Munger said years and years ago. He said, if it can be quantified, it will be emphasized, right? And he said it's often the softer stuff that is the most important in the decision-making process. So when we can find a business, and this would fall into the Buffett kind of category, with a durable competitive advantage, a business model that we think is sustainable with a durable competitive advantage over time, we spend a lot of time looking for that. It's not a characteristic of every stock we own, but we, we do spend some time looking for that. Yeah, it's, but, but what I would add is, look, um, I think you can, you can look at a company's history and see that there's quantitative evidence of a moat, right? High margins and high returns on invested capital. Um, and then you wanna understand the qualitative reasons behind that moat, right? To help you better understand, is it sustainable? And I, I'm a big fan of Pat Dorsey's book. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. I think it was the little book that builds wealth. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, 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 it's a book that's basically describes competitive advantage. And he, he basically breaks down moats into four sources. So the first one's intangible assets. These are things like brands, patents, um, uh, attributes that 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 bring with them pricing power. And we own companies like Nestle, Diageo, and Roche um, that I think fit into that camp. High switching costs, right? Um, we own a business called Saffron that makes jet engines. Once Boeing decides to use um, the Leap engine, which Saffron makes uh, for Boeing, it's it, very difficult for Boeing to, to switch that decision. Um, we look for businesses that have network effects. That's a very powerful one. It's more difficult, I think, for us to uh, uh, identify at the quantitative prices, right, that are attractive to us. But we've owned businesses like Google and MasterCard over time that we believe benefit from network effects. And then low cost producers, we, we look for that as well. We, we own a, a, a company called Anna Fagasta that makes copper that we believe is a low cost producer. Um, we've owned Cisco, the food distributor in the US in the past that mm-hmm. um, because of their scale advantages have much lower costs and better margins than their competitors. Um, and, other things that I look for, look, I love uh, fewer competitors in an industry. I love oligopolies and duopolies much more than business than industries that are highly fragmented. Um, I think stability of market share over a long period of time is another very important quality uh, characteristic. If, if, if a company's got 
stable market shares or an industry has stable market shares over time, to me, that's strongly suggests the evidence of a, of a competitive advantage. We also look for things like, you know, mix shifts in a business that may positively impact the company over time. Um, another mix, act, mix shift. Can you just mix expand? Shift on that? Yeah, we're just we're, we're, we're a company um, perhaps has a couple of different segments, but but the piece that has higher margins and higher returns on invested capital is growing faster than the rest of the so business. So, for example, Johnny Walker Black versus Johnny Walker Red, the EBIT margin is at least two and a half higher. So you, you can't look uh, uh, at the company and just look at the number of bottles they sell. You have to figure out what is the mix, and that is helpful. But what I would add to what Jay has said, you shouldn't think about us as being geniuses. We made, <laughs> we made mistakes. That means we bought Vido that is down, we bought WPP that is down. So, yeah, you know, uh, it's but we are diversified. We we and my our 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 council wants me to explain that we as uh, individuals at Tweedy also own these stocks that we're talking about. And as investors, that's another characteristic of our firm, uh, Tobias. We've uh, we've got over a billion dollars of our own capital. Uh, that's the partners. Uh, our, our families, uh, uh, retired partners, and our employees uh, all invested in uh, the commingled vehicles that we manage here at the firm, separate accounts, et cetera, and we own uh, the stocks Jay just mentioned. So we just want to make that clear as well as individuals. We think of it as a community of interest, not a conflict. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you, given the very long history of Tweedy and the uh, enormous combined experience in the room, when you look at today's market, are there any obvious analogs from uh, historical markets or do you think that this is unique in, in, in some way? Well, well yeah, nothing. Uh, what is it that we – what did Mark Twain say? History – uh, rhymes. Repeats, that rhymes. It doesn't necessarily repeat itself. I, I think that's absolutely true. Tom mentioned something earlier that, and of course it's different today. It's not 100% like this, but I couldn't help but think about parallels back to that Nifty 50 era when I think about the Fang uh, stocks today and that era between 1965. And uh, mid-1973 uh, was an era where uh, a group of securities uh, performed extraordinarily well, uh, ended up trading at more than double the market multiple. And the market multiple was high uh, during that period. And these were the, the technology stocks of the day back in those days. It was companies like IBM, Hewlett Packard, uh, Digital Equipment. Uh, Eastman, Texas Instruments, Eastman Kodak, Eastman Kodak Polaroid. Polaroid, and of course you can add Philip Morris, Avon, uh, Walmart, uh, Disney. Disney. All these stocks were part of the Nifty 50. And I think people would be shocked to know that in late 1973 and 1974, these stocks absolutely collapsed. <clears throat> Disney was down over 80%. Hard to imagine that kind of thing happening. But, you know, it reminds me today a little bit of the feeling we have about these dominant uh, technology stocks. And uh, um, full disclosure, we own uh, shares of Google, which we bought uh, many years ago at a point in time when we thought the stock was uh, cheap. But many of the others we don't own. And, of course, that's where the action has been of late, as you know. And those stocks as a group, you know, you've, you've probably heard uh, Rob Arnott's uh, presentations where he talks about the valuations of these companies. Uh, I, I seem to recall he said they're, as a group, it, they're worth four to five trillion dollars, which is greater than the, the, G, the annual GDP of most developed countries, except Japan and the United States or something. I mean, truly dominant companies growing uh, quickly, no doubt. 
uh, and and will continue uh, obviously to be good businesses, but maybe priced for perfection. Hard to know, uh, but. The Nifty 50, that era reminds me a little bit of of that aspect of today. And I think another thing I think back on, I think that Barton Biggs wrote a Barton Biggs, who was the strategist at Morgan Stanley uh, years ago, uh, I want to say in early March of 2000, wrote a piece called Even Monkeys Fall from Trees. And the piece was about value investing was once again being declared dead. Um, and um, Barton was had great courage, uh, came out in a piece, talked about this is no time to be abandoning value. Uh, you should actually be thinking about putting money in that era. You know, the, the dot coms were in ascendancy. And within three weeks of writing that piece, the um, the technology bubble burst, and these stocks came uh, came tumbling down. So that that's another thing that comes to mind. Uh, you know, in the press lately, particularly in the last year, uh, value value is no longer relevant. It's dead. It's dying. You know, I I, I could give you a pile of uh, of press. I have I, it. Don't worry. <laughs> you 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 know it. And um, I just think. Um, it's a, it, I, I can tell you in my career, I got here in 1991, and value's been declared dead three times in my career. This is the third <laughs> time. And uh, I suspect it'll be, it'll be declared again down the road, right? Um, and value is the most Jay likes to talk about. The reason why value works is it's painful at times and uh, psychologically very, very difficult uh, for people to practice because... Um, almost a condition precedent to value success are these sometimes unbearably long periods of underperformance. And we're obviously in one of those. We obviously, uh, there's one thing you can count on a Tweety. We don't change our stripes. Uh, um, and, and we think we'll, we'll come out of this. But it's, uh, it's been a tough time. I don't know I if you saw Cliff Asnes uh, published a piece uh, saying he he advocates for he says it's very hard to time when any strategy will start working. So when will value start working? Nobody really knows. But he says when the when the opportunity gets as stretched as it has been, it's time to sin a little. And he advocated for allocating a little bit more to value than you may ordinarily <laughs> allocate. And then he had to follow it up six weeks later with a, another piece that he called "Never Has a Venial Sin Been Punished So Quickly or So Violently." <laughs> <laughs> because That's it was the worst tough. six weeks in what has been a very tough decade. Yeah. Yeah. But I saw something very encouraging the other day. I look at the the French data, uh, Ken French's website. He has all of the, the factor data, Ken French of Fama French. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I looked at price to cash flow so they, you can divide it into all of the deciles. And I looked at the cheapest decile against its own long run mean. And it is since 2019 for the first time in a very long time, it's actually cheap to its long run mean. And the only other two times where that's happened in recent memory was 1998 to 2000, and then 2009 right at the bottom, both of which were uh, very good times to get started as a value investor and the, the performance thereafter was quite good. So uh, how do you feel, like, without really looking at the data anecdotally how do you feel about the prospects for value at this point in the cycle looking at your own portfolio how do you feel i would ask i would mention one thing i i, I sense a certain fragility in markets over the last couple of years uh, uh you know there have been pockets of volatility they last very briefly and as cliff said you get punished very quickly as stock prices come back but we have had pockets of volatility. And I think that is a reflection on the fact that we have very high valuations and yet, and, and facing a lot of macroeconomic issues all over the world. I think back to the Nifty 50 era and what, you know, it's hard to know exactly what brings stocks down and what causes a correction. But I remember back in that era, it was uh, the oil embargo uh, played a big role. It's a supply uh, the shock. Saudi, 
Saudis embar embargoed oil. Oil prices quadrupled in the United States. Prospects for uh, recession were knocking on the door, and and we got a big decline in stocks. It's hard to know what's going to cause that. Is it is it going to be a virus? Is it going to be uh, uh, any trust scrutiny of of technology stocks and some disappointments there? Um, is it going to be simply the fact that at some point people begin to think about low interest rates? rather than being a catalyst for market performance, may be indicating something else. It's a symptom, maybe. Something that yeah. could be an indicator of, of bigger problems. So um, who knows? We, we, we don't know. But because of this fragility and the pockets of volatility that we've been seeing, I sense we're, we're closer to that time. And it's probably, as, as Cliff would say, it's we probably should be sinning a little uh, right now. I, th I think that uh, the Nifty 50 is a very good analog for today, and I, I agree with you because I, when I look at the companies that do have the highest valuations, they do tend to be the better companies that are growing very rapidly, throwing off lots of free cash flow. Uh, it's just that I think that they're extremely expensive. When you look at Microsoft at one stage, got, got to a 2.8% free cash flow yield, um, no question that Microsoft is a fantastic business with incredibly high margins and likely expanding margins and growing at a very high rate. It's just that at 2.8 percent, it's it's getting to that point where it doesn't have a, a anywhere to go, and if it backs off a little bit from there, it's still not really cheap at three and a half percent. So that's what I, I I agree with you completely that the, the that era was a good one, is a good analog. But, what what happens thereafter? Do you uh, do you avoid value in the in the interim while the volatility in the markets takes over, or do you do you remain steadfast? Do you hold a bit more cash in the portfolio? How, how does how do you deal with that? Uh, we don't ha know how to do anything else except being value investors. You, you know, uh, uh, we we have a little bit more cash than uh, than normal. Uh, we are uh, above 10 percent. I believe we are around 12, 12 right. or 13. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we are still looking for value stock. That's the only thing we know how to do. So yeah, you could be fully invested in 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 short order yeah. if the opportunities presented right. themselves. Right, right, right. Maybe in a volatile environment, you look for the yeah. for the better businesses rather than the ones that are sort of likely to get it on the chin if. If the, if the heavy weather continues, right? So maybe, you know, we prefer to do that. So, you know, sort of the rougher the the environment you're in, the better, the, the higher the odds you buy better businesses at at decent prices, and then you know those are the ones that can can compound that you can hold for a while. But only if they fit. Yeah, the sure, criteria. sure. Yeah, that's only all. That's all. You, you know, sort of, you know, that's all. I mean, you're not, you're not going to pay up for anything. We we do the same thing. I mean, we just get a little bit more excited that we can buy better businesses. When, when March is full. Are any industries or countries looking particularly enticing? Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I could say not necessarily uh, more recently, but, but um, over the last summer of 2019, um, when it was clear that sort of the leading economic indicators in the industrial sector of the economy, like PMIs and um, in the, the industrial production indexes, were coming down substantially, right? This summer, it became consensus that manufacturing around the world was entering a recession. And so there were lots of stocks that sold off significantly um, due to expected near-term weakness in earnings, right? And so we did have the opportunity to buy a few stocks um, in in 2019 that, ref that, that met our criteria. One business that we were able to buy was a business by the name of Trelleborg. It's a company that's based in Sweden. Um, again, this is, a, this is a stock that we were able to buy at roughly nine and a half times enterprise value to EBIT plus merger amortization, so EBITA, um, around 12 times after tax earnings. It had a 3.6% dividend yield, um, and it was trading at a substantial discount to similar companies that have been acquired in m a deals and there was also substantial substantial insider buying uh by insiders at the company about three and a half million dollars worth at uh uh a, a price of around 170. and just to give you a little bit of background 
Um, Trelleborg is a is a company that makes industrial polymers. So they make essentially products made of plastic uh, and rubber. Um, and 75% of this company's earnings comes from two segments. There's, there's multiple segments, but there's really two segments that matters. The first segment is a business called Ceiling Solutions. And the Ceiling Solutions segment represents about 55% of operating profit. That's a seal. It's a yeah. This is called a wiper seal, and I'll I'll <laughs> explain to you we the significance. Mini basketball in the office. <laughs> I'll explain to you the significance of this in a minute. But <laughs> but uh, this is a business that over the last decade has grown organically about four percent, um, and it's got uh, for this seal right twenty three percent EBIT margins. Um, uh-huh. So high margin product seals are used in virtually everything, but, but, uh, you know, John Deere tractors, Caterpillar, uh, construction equipment, um, they're used in airplanes, they're used in electronics, so wide variety of uses. Seals protect equipment, they protect environment, and they protect people. Generally speaking, you're trying to keep a liquid in or keep a leak, a liquid out in an application, or you're trying to keep dirt out. Um, and the key characteristic, and this gets back to the qualitative question you answered earlier. The key characteristic is that the cost to produce this seal is relatively low relative to the value that it protects. It's considered a low cost but high fail failure consequence product. And for that reason, customers will pay more for it. Really, the key in this industry is to convince a customer that, look, uh, th- th- this seal doesn't cost a lot of money, um, but if it fails, right, you could be potentially looking at a product recall an environmental fine, um, equipment downtime, and in some cases, human safety, right? If, if the seal on the landing gear of an airplane fails, it's possible that the, you don't have a safe landing. Um, and so because it's, it's a uh, low cost, high failure consequence product, you have pricing power. And so this seal right here, it's, it's called a wiper seal. It costs five bucks for the customer. The price of this is five bucks. It's used in industrial cylinder applications, and an an industrial cylinder might cost $100. um, And that industrial cylinder goes into, let's say, a John Deere combine. And the John Deere combine, right, costs $500,000. And so that characteristic is absolutely key, right? Low cost, but high failure consequence. Good business model. Um, Also, if you look at similar businesses to Trelleborg Ceiling Solutions, there's some good M&A comps. So Michelin, right, the tire company based out of France, bought a company by the name of Fenner um, in the last couple of years and paid 18 times EBITDA for that business. Parker Hannafin, a company that that we know very well in the U.S., bought a private company uh, that competed with Trelleborg Ceiling Solutions. This private company was named Lord Corporation. Parker Hannafin paid 18 <clears throat> times EBITDA uh, for that business. We valued Trelleborg Ceiling Solutions business at 13 times EBITDA. So a pretty big discount relative to observed M&A comps. But, but we paid a little nine and a half nine, times, nine right? And a half. Nine and a half times EBITDA. And, and um, it, it's a the the uh, another 25% of this company's earnings come from uh, wheels. Um, th- this, this company is a big producer of agricultural wheels and then also wheels and tires for uh, forklifts. Um, but it's a, it's a similar situation where um, it's a pretty good business over the long term. If you look at M&A comps, Michelin paid 17 times for a business called Campso that also made agricultural tires. Um, and then there's another deal where Yokohama, am I saying that right? Yokohama um, bought a a business called Alliance Tire Group for 15 times EBIT. But so I was just add this is just uh, one of these sort of niche manufacturing businesses where value has been showing up because of the bad uh, macro data, uh, the middle of uh, of last year. There are others, and this is not a big company. This right, is, this is a four billion dollar U.S. Yeah, 4 market billion cap dollar company. But, so. Uh, there are other niche manufacturers like this that we've been able to pick up at what we think are very attractive valuations because of that uh, poor industry growth area. And a lot of these businesses we find outside the United States. The U.S. equity market, as we all know, has been the strongest equity market in the world. It's 
it's more than double the returns of 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 non-U.S. equities. And I would say today, one of the interesting things about Tweedy, if you went back when I first came to the firm in in 1991, we were largely a U.S. equity manager. Uh, we had invested anecdotally from time to time in non-U.S. securities. But since then, um, we have become much more of an international investor than we have a domestic investor. And this is simply a function of where value has shown up uh, in the world uh, for us. And I think part of that has to do, Tobias, with the fact that equity cultures outside the United States have not are not quite as advanced as we've been here in the United States. And so over time, we've gotten more inefficient pricing. When I first came to Tweedy, Frank, who spent a lot of time looking at U.S. names, it was very difficult for him to get a U.S. name through in our research process. Tom here, who was looking at a, a lot of the international names, we were buying these things right and left. And so when you look across the board at Tweedy today, I think today we're managing about $14 billion. I, I, you can't hold me to this. I think about 70% of our money is invested outside the United States. Uh, but to answer your question a little bit more specifically, <clears throat> value investing, to give you an analogy, is like duck hunting. You sit in a blind and the guy goes with a whistle and calls the ducks and if the ducks come, you shoot them. So it's whatever opportunities uh, Mr. Market is offering you. and. At this point, we find value, without mentioning names, is uh, in some European chemical companies, some Japanese chemical companies. Uh, we are buying uh, a German industrial company. Farm uh, equipment company. Uh, uh, farm equipment company. So there are pockets of clear undervaluation, uh, I would say, but they're just pockets. Yeah, anything of quality. Um, is 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 pretty expensive, pretty fully valued. So these are more cyclical businesses. Gents, uh, final question, just uh, to bring it full circle. Uh, I've noticed recently that I think Berkshire Hathaway has become extremely undervalued, and I didn't ever think that I'd see it as cheap as this in my career. Do you have any views on it? Are you are you uh, do you, do you, what, what do you think about it? Frank? Frank. Frank's our veteran uh, <laughs> Buffett watcher. So, well, I think uh, you're absolutely right. It touched uh, on the A shares 300,000 the other day. <clears throat> and uh, I would agree with you. I think the values on that name are in the 375 to $400,000 range. And, uh, and uh, you kind of hope at some point that Buffett's going to going to be able to put the 100 plus billion, 120 billion he's got in, into something that uh, that uh, compounds. But I think you do have a high quality set of businesses, great capital allocation. Um, problem is a big company, but I think as a as a as a, a nice value with Berkshire down there at 300,000 was quite good. And you get the chance to buy it right alongside Warren, right. who's, uh, who's been buying it of late. So, so, so uh, I, we notice what you noticed. <laughs> well, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, uh, Frank, Tom, Bob, Jay, Roger, it's been an absolute thrill, honor, privilege. Uh, Tweety Brown, if folks want to get in contact with you, how do they go about doing that? Um, maybe the easiest way is to visit our website, uh, www tweedy.com uh, but we're located in Stamford, Connecticut um, and we're we're accessible it's uh, it's our only office and uh, there's 48 of us uh, working hard every day here so well thank you very much gents thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Tobias. Tobias take care